uh, Dr. David Oberdo. He is currently a postdoctoral scientist uh, at Yale and a Kavli Fellow. He will be presenting his doctoral work from the Krakauer Lab. His title is Dissecting Learning and Generalization of a Continuous Motor Skill Using a Customized Video Game. Welcome, David. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. So um, yeah, today I'll be talking about how people learn uh, continuous movement skills. And um, so what is a continuous movement skill? And I think a good example is uh, Serena Williams serving. And so you can see in these videos uh, that Serena Williams has this, um, this serve that's basically a continuous movement uh, that's quite stereotyped. Um, and if it weren't for the fact that there's different people in the background of these videos, you might think that they're the same instance. Um, and now Serena Williams wasn't born knowing how to serve. This is something that she learned over uh, a lot of practice um, and a lot of experience. And so I think that that's kind of the uh, essence of what I'm talking about with cont continuous movement skills is that they're continuous um, and took a long time uh, to learn and quite stereotyped. Um, and so how might people uh, learn these types of behaviors, uh, these continuous movement skills? And one theory is what's called the action chunking theory. Um, and the idea here is, let's say that there's, for example, four movements, A, B, C, and D, uh, that for a particular behavior are required to be executed sort of in that order. So early in learning, um, you might select each of these movements individually. Uh, but with a lot of practice, um, the theory goes that this sequence of movements um, coalesces into what's called a chunk, uh, where the action selection um, occurs at the level of the chunk uh, instead of at the level of the individual movements themselves. And so I think a good example of this is, say, playing piano, where you have to press individual keys um, in a discrete way. But with a lot of practice, uh, that becomes somewhat automatic. Um, and so the question is, do continuous movements like a tennis serve um, kind of fall under this, this model? Or is, is this model applicable to these continuous uh, movement skills? And um, to answer this question, I think we need to actually move away from tasks that uh, require a behavior that is fundamentally um, the selection of discrete actions. In other words, we need a new kind of task that actually requires um, continuous movements. And so to do this, we partnered with a uh, video game company uh, that was started um, at, at Hopkins. Uh, and um, they, they built us a, a game uh, on an Apple iPad that requires participants to steer this little cartoon character along a uh, winding and narrow path by tilting the, uh, the tablet. And so I have a few examples of what that looks like. And so um, here, this is a participant on day one. Uh, and you can see that they're prone to falling off. Uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily have this, this skill down yet. Um, but if we fast forward to their fifth day of training, um, we'll see that they're, they're a little bit better at this um, continuous movement skill. So uh, that gives you an idea uh, on one hand of um, you know, what, what learning looks like, but also just how uh, kind of new and, and sort of fun um, this task is. And uh, from this task, uh, the kind of data that we get and the things that we can look at are the um, trajectory of the little character in the game. And so you see examples of this for one participant on the left, where we can plot the actual trajectory um, of the character in the game uh, on the track. And we can look at this across days uh, of training. Um, and a couple of things that you notice are that um, the distance that uh, the participants got on each trial on average increases across training. Um, and another thing is that the variability of their movements uh, seems to reduce, so they be, uh, become more stereotyped. And then other data that we get from this game uh, are the tablet tilt directions. And so this is just the angular direction that they were tilting the tablet. Um, and you can see, you know, concordant with the uh, car paths that the duration that they stay on the track seems to increase 
um, as well as the variability um, uh, of their movements seems to decrease with training. And so we'll be looking at the distance traveled and the movement kinematics um, uh, in, in terms of movement variability. And uh, linking this back to, to the chunking theory, the kind of key manipulation that we're going to do um, in order to test that theory is introduce what we call a probe track, uh, which is uh, just the mirror image of the track that they were training on. Um, and uh, the critical you know, test or assessment is to look at how behavior changes or doesn't um, when they encounter this probe track. Uh, and so the, the way this worked is that participants um, trained exclusively on this training track for up to 10 days. Uh, and then they were introduced this probe track um, for uh, you know, a continuous sequence of trials um, uh, only on their sort of last day of training or once during their training. Um, and so the, the critical thing we're looking at is to see how their performance is affected in these probes. Uh, and just to be clear, under the chunking model, we would expect that their performance would um, degrade uh, because the probe track requires um, an entirely different uh, sequence of actions. And so we're gonna look at what happens during these probes. And if we look at the distance traveled measure, um, there's a couple of things uh, to point out. Um, so the first is that across days, uh, performance improves. And so you can see that by looking at the window that I've labeled here as the pre-probe, which is um, trials that were done on the training track just before the probe was introduced. Uh, and so you can see that across days, their performance on average is increasing. Um, another thing to point out is that during the probes, their performance uh, transiently drops, but then recovers to about 90% of where they were before that probe was introduced. Um, and that's true of days three and onward. Um, and so you might say, well, look, the behavior is a little bit worse, um, but I think the critical point is to point out that uh, the behavior isn't at baseline. So the probe doesn't induce this catastrophic, um, uh, you know, decrement in their performance according to the distance travel. And so I would argue that this actually uh, violates the chunking theory um, because the probe track requires an entirely different um, set of actions. Uh, and we can look at the um, behavior in terms of uh, the kinematics. And so what we've done here is we've um, taken just a segment of the track, the, the first turn, uh, and looked at only those trajectories that made it through at least that first turn. Um, and what you can see is that the trajectories, uh, their variability seems to come down across learning, so from days one to 10, uh, and then seems to be also low during the probe. Uh, so the, that top panel of individual trajectories is just a single participant as an example, um, but we can get a more concrete measure of the variability by doing PCA, uh, principal component analysis, um, across those trajectories. Um, and then get a measure of variability over the first couple of uh, principal components, um, and then plot that across training and during the probes. Uh, and so on the bottom left, you can see um, that variability as it changes over practice, uh, and then during the probes, and critically, um, the variability didn't really change um, during the probes. And so there wasn't really evidence of the variability somehow regressing to some previous state of learning. Uh, and so um, I think this is quite strong evidence against the chunking model. Uh, however, we have this potential slight discrepancy um, between our performance measure that's based on the distance traveled and the performance measure based on these kinematics. Um, and we, we'd like to explore this and uh, see what's going on here. So I think the one key thing to keep in mind is that um, participants can fail on any trial, um, even if it's the training track, the one they've practiced for 10 days. Um, uh, and, and that's true, of course, also of the probe, but we wanted to check if the way that failures are occurring um, is different or the same between training and the probe. Um, and so to do this, we introduced a, a new um, kind of analysis where we look at the action that individuals are taking across different states of uh, the trajectory. So we defined a state space that included um, different locations on the track, 
uh, and actually also different um, car heading directions. Um, and we defined what we call uh, as a policy, um, what we call a policy, which is defined as the average uh, tilt direction at each state among trajectories that were successful. And uh, from this policy, we can define what I call a policy deviation, um, which is uh, the absolute angular distance between an individual trajectory's action at a given state and uh, the policy at that state. Um, and the way that we can use this to assess how uh, failures are occurring is to look at the policy deviation um, of all trajectories that fell off uh, aligned to the point at which they fell off. And so in this plot on the far right, um, the, uh, the darker uh, curve is showing the policy deviation um, of failure trajectories uh, that are aligned you know, at zero to the point where they fell off. And then successes that are within that neighborhood um, as a comparison. And you can see that the way that trajectories fail is that they have this um, sort of momentary lapse uh, right at the end before they fall off. And so they seem to be quite consistent with the successes up until just before they fall off when they have this lapse. And so we can ask if uh, people are failing in the same or different ways uh, during the probe as they were during the training or the pre-probe. Um, and it turns out that we really have no evidence of the trajectories failing in different ways. Uh, in other words, they, they fail the same way, whether they're on the training track or the probe track. Um, however, what was different is the uh, proportion of trajectories for which a failure occurred, for which a lapse occurred. Uh, and so during the probes, their proportion of having one of these momentary lapses just happened to increase. Um, and so this potentially could happen because they're somehow distracted. Um, something is going on, but what's not going on is that their, their skill, their movement ability, the ability to um, make these continuous movements seems to be consistent during the probes. Um, and so as an alternative to the chunking theory, um, we are calling this a uh, sort of learning a flexible policy um, where a policy is defined as a map between uh, the state, say of the individual in the world, um, to actions that would be required at that state. And so linking this back to Serena Williams serving, uh, she goes through these different states of her body um, and in the world around her. And at each state, there's um, basically an, an action that is, is sort of best for that particular contingency. Um, and so, you know, we're suggesting that this data is uh, actually inconsistent with the chunking model. Um, and instead, it seems consistent with individuals learning some flexible uh, control policy um, that's, that's partly defined, uh, you know, within a, um, a state space. Um, and it seems like lapses are responsible for failures um, and that probe tracks induce more lapses. Uh, they don't induce a decline in skill. And so um, I would like to thank uh, my PA advisors, uh, John Krakauer and Adrian Haith uh, from the Boyum Lab, as well as the Kata Project, um, composed at least uh, initially of uh, Omar Ahmad, Kat McNally, and Pramit Roy, who um, built the video game for us. Uh, and of course, I, I'd like to thank my current funders um, uh, through Yale, the Kavli uh, Foundation, Center for Research Computing, and the Studios Foundation. Thank you for that lovely talk. Um, I, I have a few questions, but one of the first questions I was thinking about was when you were showing these tracks, um, uh, what are the age of your participants? I have a seven year old who does we when she I does see. this. And it's fun, great to watch her try to navigate this environment. So I was curious about the age of your participants. <laughs> right, they, they were um, young adults, basically college students, um, graduate students. Yeah. Also need money. <laughs> right. right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're susceptible to my persuasion. <laughs> right, great. So we have one question in the um, um, Q&A. 
So, um, hi, David, great talk. Did people train on a single track or on multiple ones? Do you think uh, the people yeah. would learn differently? Oh, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Or, uh, oh, um, sorry, real quick. The first question, uh, the answer to the first question, they trained on only one track. So it was the same track all, all throughout training until they received that probe, which was just the mirror image. Do you think that people would learn differently if you were to offer them a set of tracks? Yeah, good question. I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and uh, I, I think potentially, uh, and I, I would say that potentially they would learn differently um, in the sense of perhaps doing even better during the probes, maybe because they have had this um, experience of seeing multiple different tracks. And so when they get this new thing, it doesn't sort of throw them off as, as much. Right, yes. Uh, the, uh, another question is, do you think you would have found the results inconsistent with uh, chunking if you had reordered maybe leave the first turn out, uh, the training turns, rather than inverting them during the probe. Wait, um, sorry, I, there's something I didn't understand. Is this a... Carly Sombrick. Okay. Yeah. Oh, reordered them. Um, I see. Um, right. Yeah, no, th th that's a good point. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. If if you had just reordered the turns, but they were otherwise um, identical uh, turns, um, then the chunking model, I, I think, would expect you to have actually better performance, um, potentially, in, in as much as if you uh, can imagine a task that, say, has two chunks or something. Uh, so maybe you would say like actions A, B, C is one chunk, um, you know, and the next three is another chunk, but then you flip them um, uh, under some instances of the chunking model, I think you would expect that um, putting them in different orders might retain the sort of improvement within a kind of sub chunk. So yeah, it could get complicated and um, it might not be entirely inconsistent, Yeah. I, I'm sorry, you do have more questions in here, but we're almost um, going to get kicked out of here in a minute or so. So I just want to thank everybody for a lovely talk, a, a wonderful discussion. And I just wanted to finish by saying, we see some of these things in your in our MICE model, actually. So I was really excited to see your <laughs> uh, the, the way human performs and MICE perform may have some similarities here. So right. when you face the model system. <laughs> Great. Thank you again. That was a wonderful session. And I hope you all enjoyed uh, the um, Neuromatch Academy series and uh, hope to see you all.